Aloha and welcome back to Politics and Land in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tank Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Sterling Higa, the Executive Director of Housing in Hawaii's Future. Two years ago, Colbert Matsumoto put us in touch um, to discuss housing and we met at Danny's restaurant on Kauai, which has since closed. Sterling is a former debate champion and coach, college lecturer at Hawaii Pacific University and is coached at Punahou also, right, Sterling? Yep, back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. My, my experience with judging high school speech and debate tournaments, I felt inadequate. They even, they even asked me if I wanted to change my answer when I judged. <laughs> that was when my son uh, was competing and also Senator uh, Stanley Chang was in high school. Stanley is now in the legislature and pushing for affordable housing also. Uh, among other things, Sterling is a hip hop rapper and was nominated to a Nahoku Hanohano Award with one of his albums. Perhaps we can listen to a clip if we have time. Sterling, <laughs> welcome, to th welcome to Think Tank Hawaii. Awesome, thank you for having me, Dennis. Yeah. First, uh, please tell us a little more about your background and why you're doing this. So I grew up in Honolulu and attended public schools, graduating from Roosevelt. And every year since my graduation, I've watched more and more of my classmates move to the mainland to pursue opportunity elsewhere. And one of the biggest reasons they leave is because they can't afford to buy a home here as they start their families. Um, you know, I would love to have a future in Hawaii for my own. Uh, three children. My wife and I have three children with one more on the way. Uh, I want to have a future where my children, my grandchildren can afford to stay in Hawaii so that we no longer have people feeling like they have to leave. Okay, so how did you get started with this uh, project? So I was approached by Colbert Matsumoto, who put me in touch with two young men, Zachary Yamada and Evan Gates. Zach was a recent college graduate, and Evan was a college student taking a gap year during COVID. And they had been working on the plans for Housing Hawaii's Future, which is a 501c3 nonprofit whose goal is to build a movement of millennials and Gen Z to help end the workforce housing shortage. Um, Zach and Evan had realized after talking with three dozen experts on housing with expertise spanning back decades, and they read a bunch of papers, what they realized was that young people had never been involved in the discussions around housing. And the concerns that young people have when they're starting their careers and families weren't being represented. And the people who needed starter homes to get a jump on life were just left out of the equation. So what they decided was if you could organize millennials and Gen Z, you would create these powerful advocates, not uh, from the perspective of trying to get rich like developers or trade and industry groups, but from the perspective of the people who ultimately will live in the housing that's being built. Um, and that that would lead us our, as a community to you know, solve this problem once and for all so that young people can afford to stay here. Yeah, I understand you've been uh, talking to a lot of people like Habitat for Humanity uh, and some developers. Can you tell us some of the, are you at liberty to mention yeah, who you've sure. been talking to? Yeah, well, we've talked to a lot of people, and if anybody watching this wants to talk, you know, I'm happy to discuss. Um, the approach so far has been to learn from as many people as we can. So, you know, we've talked with affordable housing developers like Stanford Carr and Makani Maeva. We've talked to some of the community land trusts like Cassandra Abdul at Nahaleo Maui, the community land trust on Maui, the representatives from the Habitat for Humanity chapters. We've also talked with contractors, with building suppliers, and with all the people along the chain of housing development down to the people who are um, either unable to afford homes because they've been priced out or the people who've been lucky enough to afford homes because they benefited from some of the home buyer education programs that are put on by Hawaiian community assets or the Hawaii Home Ownership Center. So by talking to all these stakeholders, we've tried to form a complete picture of what's going on in housing so that we can find a solution that works in the real world. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, Habitat for Humanity. They, they've been doing a lot of good work on the island of Kauai over here. Um, 
I think that that model is pretty good. And uh, that the self-help housing, they've been doing a lot of good work too. Uh, yeah, the self-help housing model is amazing. Yeah. Having people contribute that sweat equity to build their homes really, you know, connects. Uh, it, it helps them to realize the value of a home. And obviously, because they're investing that sweat equity, you can reduce the cost of constructing the home, which ultimately makes it more affordable for that buyer. Okay, and uh, in speaking with the developers, I'm sure they've uh, spoken of government regulations and red tape. What have you heard? So there was a great report that was released uh, by the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization, UHERO, about the Wharton Index, which found that Hawaii's counties are among the most regulated in the entire country. And there's agreement on everyone's part that regulation is a major source of the cost of housing. So addressing government regulation is going to be one of the pieces to bringing the cost of housing down to the price where a local family can afford it. Yeah, I, I think um, that's a large part of it, you know, but, but it seems like politicians all talking about housing, right? They, and at the same time, there's more and more regulation going on. You know, and uh, <laughs> as they say, they're cutting the red tape, but they're cutting it lengthwise. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of lead, you know, this, this is another example. You say, oh, you're, you're uh, not going to be, you know, you cannot be more than three, the lead to width ratio, three to one. And if not, you got to go to this lead to your, up to uh, variance process, with a, which I went through. And it's still, you know, taking months and months you know, just to get a lot to, to be approved that's more than three to one length to it. I mean, like, uh, seem like, you know, on the verge of ridiculousness. Um, they were talking about the Singapore model. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So Senator Stanley Chang has been the most vocal advocate in Hawaii for the Singapore model, which is basically the government serving as a developer and then uh, leasing out homes to uh, customers or citizens ultimately on a leasehold model. So the people would not own the ground, but they would have the right to occupy the unit for you know, up to 99 years. And that's one model that's been proposed for how to deal with um, our cost of housing in Hawaii, obviously, especially in urban Honolulu, for example, the cost of land is one of the major factors that prevents the development of new housing. So if the government steps in to provide that land to develop housing, that's one way to reduce the cost of housing. And a leasehold, which is somewhere between renting and owning something outright fee simple, is one way to reduce the cost of housing because the buyer doesn't have to pay for the cost of the underlying land value that's um interesting i think i brought it up before because in the past uh there were some land large land owners with uh homes then the hawaii state uh government i don't know if you heard of the land reform act i think 70s 80s they forced this that only to sell the uh the interest in the land they were forced to sell it. Uh, it's kind of going the opposite way now. They're going with, to the leasehold. Um, yeah, I mean, the birth of Hawaii Kai in large part was, um, you know, leasehold lands ultimately being converted to fee simple when the Hawaii State Supreme Court forced a lot of those uh, large landowners ultimately to, to sell those leasehold properties. Um, I think leasehold is only one of many options that are sort of on the table for addressing the housing crisis. But at this point, we have to have an open mind and, and keep a lot of options available because um, there's no, I think, like silver bullet for addressing housing. It's going to take a lot of different elements. Yeah, they, you know, there's a lot of factors. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of them uh, stemming from that government red tape, and uh, all the developers have been saying that, you know, taking very long to do a project. 
um, and then the government comes in and says, oh, we're under housing, we got to do it now. And then we, then we got to impose more uh, taxes, if you will, and you know, everybody else will do that. They got developers do it uh, with the tax credits. You know, that's how they, they fund these projects. And when developers you know, uh, do a project, the government comes out and say, you gotta do, you gotta pay X amount of dollars to fund these affordable housing projects. Um, I think it was in the 80s and 90s, the, um, there was one, uh, I think it was 60% had to be affordable. And that's when the developers thought it was a little bit too much. Um, a lot of big developers had a hard time. But then uh, when HFDC was first formed, they, they did uh, started Kapolei and the big uh, projects. They had a mix of market homes and low income, and as well as the Act 15, which expedited um, review. That that really helped uh, the projects and the profits, if you will, from the market homes helped subsidize the other ones. So I think it was a good uh, good way to do housing. And that they, when different administration came in after I hit, and you know they went out of that, and later on they came in. Uh, they started HHFDC, but they're not doing anything of that they were doing uh, before during the Wahia time. Uh, you know anything about that? Yeah, well, the Wahia administration was one of the golden eras for housing construction in Hawaii. One of the keys that Governor Wahia um, told me about when we had a conversation was he had an agency, the Office of State Planning, which was tasked with helping to get all of the ducks in a row in the administration. So oftentimes development gets slowed down because different departments and agencies don't work with each other at the state level and they don't work well with the counties. But what Governor Waihe recognized, and I think he was correct to do this, was if you were able to coordinate the government better, you could speed things up, which ultimately reduces the cost of constructing housing. And that's an approach that I think any future governor, including the incoming Governor Green, would do well to consider is, you know, coordinating the state departments and agencies to make sure that they're all driving toward housing. Yeah, like, uh, like I said, you know, all the politicians talk about housing and uh, Governor-elect Green, you know, mentioned his project he was involved in. I think they were like, 36 homes or something, but the needs is like thousands, right? So, you know, we got a lot, a uh, long way to go. So what have you heard from the developers? What else you heard from the developers that you've spoken to? So a, a big concern among developers is the uncertainty regarding approvals, especially discretionary approvals by say the county council. Um, oftentimes developers have to go through two processes. For example, the Kobayashi group, which is developing Kuile Place on Kapiolani Boulevard in Honolulu, has to go to HHFDC for one 201H approval to get exemptions from certain um, density and height requirements, then and to apply for funding. And then they have to go to the county council for a similar approval uh, to get it passed by the county council. Um, one of the things that 201H was intended to do was to help to reduce the burden of having to get discretionary approvals at the county council level. Um, but ultimately, the developers still have to go through both processes. Um, sometimes the discretionary approval at the county council ends up destroying a project entirely, which was the case with Makani Maeva's project in Kailua where the county council initially was supportive of the project. And then after a small bit of community opposition, 
the county council sort of caved and ended up opposing the project and denying um, Makani Maeva the exemptions that she needed to complete the project. That's the kind of issue that developers uh, really get uneasy about because if you invest hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in your pre-construction planning uh, and then you're not able to actually complete the project, that's money that's all gone. So one of the proposals that developers will talk about is buy right development, which means if a project meets these certain criteria, like it has such a number of affordable units and it's in locations where we want affordable units, et cetera, then the project would automatically be granted approval. That's one of the ways to take the politics out of development. Um, obviously, politicians are reluctant to adopt by right approvals because that's one of the ways that they gain power and influence. Uh, you're more likely to be able to go to developers for campaign donations if you're the one who gets to decide whether or not they can build their uh, project at the end of the day. So I think there's a contest that we have to address where, you know, who should be making the final decision about what gets built? Um, is it something we want to leave in the hands of elected officials who oftentimes will respond to the most vocal, not in my backyard or NIMBY opposition groups? Or is it something where we want to determine a process for how we approve projects? and allow people who meet those criteria to automatically be able to build um, the housing that they want to. Yeah, it's um, going back to the 80s. I think I think it was 80s and 90s. There was the Act 15 that uh, HFTC had that uh, could uh, just give, grant the uh, Permits in the supersede some of the county uh, zoning and construction issues, uh, but then the county came and said, "Okay, we're not going to inspect it, and you know, we're not going to accept the road." So they, you know, they got to have coordination over there. I think um, HFTC is still paying, you know, for some of the things that they did a long time ago because of that. What about the? Um, let's talk about doing away with the land use commission. What do you think about that? So the, the controversy with the land use commission is that if you have a parcel of land, you have to have it um, allocated to a certain land use, like say urban land use at the land use commission. And then you have to go to a separate county level for zoning. And what ends up happening is this adds a long uh, step Land use commission proceedings very often are, they can be contested case proceedings where an intervener can enter in and cause legal challenges that ultimately make the land use commission decision take years potentially. I don't know what the best answer is. One of the solutions that was proposed last legislative session by Representative Hashimoto from Maui is um, changing the requirement of going to the land use commission when you're dealing with parcels below a certain uh, threshold. So only having to go through land use commission approvals if you're dealing with a very large development, um, but allowing things to go much quicker through the county level if you're dealing with a small amount of uh, land. This is based on a principle called home rule, which says, you know, the county's can make more of the decisions regarding land. And that's one of the options to reduce the amount of uh, decisions that have to go through the Land Use Commission. I, I believe as of now, um, the cutoff point is 15 acres. So, you know, if it's smaller than that, I believe you just go to the uh, county or city level. Um, right, and I think the proposal from Rep Hashimoto was to increase that threshold to 50 acres. Uh, um, uh, it didn't get through uh, session last time, but I think it's a bill that's worthy of reconsideration. Whether the threshold should be 15 or 50 or somewhere in between is a matter I think that the public can debate. Um, but it does seem that at least right now, the, the fact of having to go through LUC and then through the county zoning is definitely adding a layer, which then adds the time and the uncertainty because each of those decisions, LUC and the county, 
are both then discretionary decisions where someone can say no uh, and and deny you what you're asking for. Yeah, it's uh, you know it might take years for you know to get the, all that uh, permitting or the entitlements. Um, in fact, they got. Uh, sometimes it's hard to dispute or get away from it. In fact, now they're imposing uh, more cultural evaluations, like the Kapakai analysis. Um, I guess it was in a book for a while, there, but they clamping down on that when you know some of the people uh, bring up more old cultural things. Look at the rules. You got to go back. To the original time of the Mahali, and you know, takes, takes a lot of things, even on pieces that were, uh, let's say, developed but worked on, you know, throughout the years, a hundred years. But you still got to go back and look at the uh, report. You heard anything about that? Well, it, generally, there are kind of two classes of. Um, challenges to land use that come up often. The cultural challenges are coming from native Hawaiians. Sometimes developments are slated for areas where there are ivi kupuna or um, you know buried ancestors or sacred sites like heiaus. Um, in either of those cases, I think we have to be careful to preserve um, the culture that is there. And then you have the environmental challenges where they don't want the development to occur if it threatens endangered species. Obviously, there are some concerns about development occurring in the sea level rise area. Um, I think both of these concerns, the cultural and the environmental concerns, are both legitimate. Uh, one of the issues at the state level, though, is these concerns are handled by different agencies. Um, those agencies don't always work in an efficient, coordinated manner. So if you're a developer, you have to go through, say, the State Historic Preservation Division to get your approvals for all of the cultural issues and then another division to deal with the concerns about sea level rise. And every delay in each of these departments is something that adds, again, that time, uncertainty, risk, and the cost to development. Yeah, I mean, I you know, understand it has to be a, uh, you know, it's a sensitive issue with the cultural, you know, sacred sites, environmental, but, uh, is it's it's not cut and dry. It seems like it's uh, arbitrary, you know. Um, so you don't get a clear cut answer on that, on that after, unless you go through the whole process a year. Sometimes they, even the vicinity of some cultural thing, they're talking about something that's miles away, and then the people doing the um, you know, the commissioners or, you know, they're kind of confused that if they think you're talking about this project when some, some other issues, environmental or something, is not exactly on the project. So it kind of messes up things. Yeah. And that's where I think, you know, we need transparent criteria um, for what would be approved or disapproved. And these have to be a matter of robust public debate. I don't think the best solution is allowing a few bureaucrats in an office somewhere or a few non-elected commissioners to make decisions that have such a huge impact on housing. Yeah, well, <laughs> good luck in trying to, trying to have that uh, uh, change that. So have you, have you been working with uh, some of the elected officials also? So uh, Housing Hawaii's future, we often meet with both elected officials and some of the civil servants that work in the county and state administrations to ask for their advice on things. Um, you know, our hope is ultimately that the young people who are getting involved can help, you know, motivate some of these, what we call decision makers, these important stakeholders to, to move in the same direction. The most gratifying and encouraging thing so far is all of the elected officials and civil servants we've spoken to, um, you know, they want to address the housing issue and they want to help improve the situation for young people. And I think part of what 
Housing Hawaii's future and other housing organizations can do is help to reflect back the way that their decisions are actually impacting housing. So making sure that their good intentions are backed up by the right kinds of actions um, that are moving us toward housing. Yeah, I mean, you say they're getting motivated, but I think they should be motivated if they're an office already. <laughs> well, we hear a lot of talk in this past uh, months prior to the election, everybody talking about housing, right? Um, you see any changes coming up? Uh, or I guess it, it'll be a prediction, but. I think, I mean, there are encouraging signs. Uh, you know, Governor-elect Green made campaign promises to take decisive action on housing. It was the number one issue, he said, in a lot of public forums. On Maui, uh, in the race for mayor, uh, uh, mayor-elect Judge Bisson uh, made housing a key element of his campaign and said that he would also take decisive action to address housing. So at least in Maui County in this next year and at the state level, you have executive leaders who have made this a priority. The thing now for members of the public to do is to help hold these executives accountable and to make sure that they deliver on the promises that they made during the campaign. Well, that's easier said than done. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah. And uh, another thing about housing is homelessness. You got any thoughts on that? So homelessness and housing are definitely related. Uh, homelessness does mix in a couple of other big issues, which is um, treatments for drug addiction and also for mental health. So oftentimes homelessness is caused by one or a combination of drug addiction or mental health, uh, mental illness. And so addressing homelessness is not just a matter of providing housing. Oftentimes you need the wraparound services that will help somebody get the medication they need or the mental health treatment they need so that they can uh, progress toward you know, being a fully functional member of society, being able to work and support themselves and be responsible for themselves and to care for others as well. Um, what Housing Hawaii's future tends to focus on though is housing in the sort of middle class range, uh, what is called the gap group, which uh, for people who are familiar with area median income is typically from like 80 to 140% area median income. These are people who are employed, and are working. They're your teachers, your firefighters, your police officers. They earn a decent wage at work, but they're priced out of the housing market because there are no starter homes available for them. So at Housing Hawaii's Future, we support the work of all of the groups that deal with homelessness issues. And I think that the work that they do is important. Although our focus remains on this middle-class gap housing group, um, because these are you know, the civil servants we need uh, to help Hawaii progress, and it's also the people that we're leave, uh, losing often when they leave Hawaii to pursue opportunity elsewhere. And we want to sort of, you know, plug the holes in the bucket so that those people can stay here. Yeah, uh, I understand, you know, that <clears throat> certain issues that uh, associated with homelessness, you know, drug and such, but uh, there, you know, there are some, I guess, some people call houseless, you know, this. You know, they didn't not in the middle class. So they just kind of had so they could pile up in two, three families in one house, or you know, went even live in the cars. Um, I heard a little bit about uh, some legislators talking about the Finnish solution for homelessness from Finland or something. Have you heard anything about that? So. Uh my understanding, and I'm not an expert on the Finnish model, is that it is a lot of these uh, social supports. So your, your mental health care, all of the, the other things besides housing that are necessary for someone to have a you know, well-integrated life. And, and that's something that we can definitely improve in Hawaii in terms of dealing with the homelessness issue. So we have to go to Finland to, to get the solution? <laughs> well, I, you know, 
I think it's valuable. Uh, Hawaii often sends delegations. They've sent a delegation to Singapore, to Vienna, uh, to Finland to learn from some of these models. Now, you know, there's a danger, right? Which is we are not Singapore right, right. or exactly. Vienna or Finland. Although there are certain elements that we can take from this. It's kind of like a, a grab bag or a potluck where, you know, we could take a little bit from each of these and combine it into something that works for Hawaii. I'm definitely cautious. Um, you know, people will often get really excited about a certain model of housing and they'll wonder why we can't do it here. And usually there's a good reason why we can't do it here. Um, for example, you know, Singapore had uh, it, an incredible executive leader who basically ruled like an autocrat for decades, who was able to implement their housing program. Uh, we don't have that system, right? We have a more democratic system with checks and balances. Um, even somebody who wanted to do a radical action like the Singapore housing model wouldn't be able to do that in Hawaii without resistance. So I think the best thing for us is to figure out what our problems are in Hawaii, to clearly identify them. And then once we have identified the problem to figure out, is there somebody who has part of the solution to this problem? And can we take a piece of that to implement here? Um, have you reached out uh, to University of Hawaii, DERP, uh, Urban and Regional Planning, uh, guys like Carl Kim? So I, I have had a conversation with Carl Kim, not about housing, but about yeah. um, something else. Um, McKenna Kaufman at yeah, DERP right. is a, a right. you know, great expert on terms of energy and transportation. And so, yeah, when, when we need to talk about urban planning, we talk to people from DERP. They're the experts. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, you have time for a rap song or a wrap up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no time for a rap song, but uh, I hope that you know viewers will get engaged with Housing Hawaii's Future. Um, we're at uh, hawaiisfuture.org and also on all of the social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can find us at Hawaii's Future. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, what 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 are your uh, uh, your songs? Your your rap? Uh, if you want <laughs> uh, to look it up, if people want to look it up, the album is called uh, Shore Lines, and the producer that I collaborated with is a wonderful producer named Scott Otoro. Uh, o H T O R O. So we recorded an album called Shore Lines uh, together. And that's available on all of the streaming platforms, Bandcamp, Apple Music, Spotify, et cetera. Yeah, thanks. Good luck with that too. And good luck with your organization and helping people. Uh, thanks. Um, awesome. Uh, Thank you, running out, of, run, running out of time. Thank you our, to our guest, Sterling Higa. Mahalo to our viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech Hawaii free media shows, please help support this non-profit platform with a donation. Aloha, ahui ho, malama pono. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.